Welcome to a tutorial on thyroid stimulating hormone, which is a hormone that is produced by the anterior pituitary. Now, the functions of thyroid stimulating hormone are to cause the thyroid gland to produce thyroid hormones. Thyroid hormones is the broad term that we use to discuss hormones that are produced by the thyroid, which include T3 and T4. The functions of thyroid stimulating hormone are based in metabolism, and metabolism seems like a fairly superficial view until you consider all of the many things in the body that are directly related to metabolism. So this would be related to carbohydrates, lipids, and protein metabolism. We increase protein synthesis when thyroid stimulating hormone is released, and this has to do with the mechanism of action that thyroid hormone has on the cells. The increased protein synthesis oftentimes results in increased enzyme production and those increased enzyme projections are going to facilitate the metabolism of carbohydrates, lipids, and proteins within cells. Aside from increasing protein synthesis, there are a whole host of effects that we see which are directly related to metabolism. So we know that thyroid hormones assist with body temperature regulation. Anytime the body is exposed to decreases in temperature over a, a couple of days, the anterior pituitary will increase thyroid stimulating hormone production to help elevate body temperature. Interestingly enough, this is directly linked to metabolism. As metabolism increases and the cellular reactions occur, heat is given off as a byproduct. So the first thing we're going to do is we're going to look at the interactions between the hypothalamus, the pituitary gland, and the thyroid gland. And then we're going to talk about what type of chemical, whether it's a lipid-based or protein-based chemical, are the thyroid hormones. So the very first thing that we're going to do is we're going to diagram the thyroid hormones. In all of my illustrations, I begin with the floor of the hypothalamus and the pituitary. Now, this represents the floor of my brain, the hypothalamus, and then this is the pituitary gland connected by an isthmus. This is the anterior aspect of the pituitary, and this is the posterior aspect of the pituitary. Now, the anterior and posterior aspects of the pituitary have come developmentally from different tissues, so they behave very differently. And the anterior pituitary originated down in the pharynx and as an embryo, and then migrated up to the brain. So the hypothalamus is connected to the anterior pituitary via capillary networks. So when the hypothalamus detects changes in metabolism, and this is a very good job for the hypothalamus considering that that's what the hypothalamus does. It monitors things like hunger, satiation, temperature, and so having a hormonal control to be able to increase these will be very useful. So the hormone that is released by the hypothalamus is thyrotropin releasing hormone. And thyrotropin hormones are the hormones that are often released by the hypothalamus. And when thyrotropin releasing hormone is secreted, it travels through capillaries to the anterior pituitary. Once in the anterior pituitary, this is going to engage cells to secrete thyroid stimulating hormone. Now these are the abbreviations that are commonly used in the anatomy and physiology field. So TRH is thyrotropin releasing hormone and TSH is thyroid stimulating hormone. Once thyroid stimulating hormone is released, it's going to enter into circulation. The gland that is more vascular than any other endocrine gland is the thyroid gland. So TSH is targeting the thyroid gland, and the thyroid gland has a substantial supply of blood. So it's a very good mechanism for thyroid stimulating hormone to engage the receptors at the thyroid gland. Now the thyroid gland is butterfly shaped. It's going to be located just inferior to the larynx, and it's going to wrap around the trachea to the posterior side to where the esophagus is. Now, the thyroid gland is going to be producing the thyroid hormones. So when TSH targets the thyroid gland, 
then the thyroid gland is going to begin secretion of thyroid hormones. Those thyroid hormones is the broad category for the actual hormones that are produced, an active state and an inactive form that are going to be released into circulation. So the active state is T3 and the inactive is T4. T3 stands for triiodothyronine and T4 stands for tetraiodothyronine, but it's also commonly referred to as thyroxine. About 10% of the secreted thyroid hormones is going to be the active T3 and then the remaining 90% is going to be T4. And that remaining 90% is going to be bound to proteins in circulation. So we release an active form that's going to directly impact cells and we have an inactive form that's going to help maintain circulating levels of these thyroid hormones to maintain a relatively consistent level of hormones. And there are two types of proteins that T4 attach to. The first are albumins, and the albumins are these giant proteins. In fact, they're the most abundant protein that we find in circulation. And these albumins are going to bind some of this T4, but only 20 to 30 percent end up bound to the albumin. The remaining are going to be bound to globulins. And globulins are the second most numerous protein in circulation, but it is the preferred binding site for T4. So approximately 70 to 75 percent of the proteins that are binding T4 will be globulin in nature. In fact, the name for the majority of the globulins that bind T4 are thyroxine binding globulins. T3 and T4 include the word iodine in them. Triiodo or tetraiodo is an indicator of how many iodines are connected to these thyroid hormones. So what this means is, is that there's this very important mineral, iodine, that must be present inside the thyroid gland in order to get adequate secretion of the T3 and T4 hormones. So in order for this system to work well, we have to have iodine in the thyroid gland as well as thyroid stimulating hormone to the thyroid gland and the thyroid gland has to be sensitive to these hormones. Now a big question is what is the overall effect of thyroid hormones? Well remember the purpose of thyroid hormones is to affect metabolism. And what thyroid hormones do is they interact with the DNA. And when they interact with DNA, they are going to regulate genes. So thyroid hormones are going to enter into circulation. They will be taken into cells across the plasma membrane where they will also cross the nuclear membrane and bind directly with the DNA. There are certain sites on the DNA that are sensitive to thyroid hormone and this is going to engage the processes of transcription and translation. The processes of transcription and translation are going to be involved in creating the ultimate product of an enzyme. But this is going to involve the step-by-step -step sequences of making a transcription of a messenger RNA that messenger RNA has to leave the nuclear envelope and target a ribosome and then the ribosome is going to use that code of the messenger RNA in order to produce a protein. So the step-by-step -step system is going to start with hormones being released that target the DNA. The DNA starting to express certain genes, those genes being translated into active proteins that are going to directly impact carbohydrate, lipid, and protein metabolism. Then we'll see a series of side effects associated with that, like elevation in temperature as metabolism increases, elevations in heart rate and respiratory rate as the demands for oxygen at the tissues increase. There are a couple of things that are going to trigger the release of thyroid hormones. First and foremost, stress. Now, as students, we typically associate stress as this idea of, I've got an exam, I'm feeling so stressed. But the body considers stress anything that increases the metabolic demand. So this could be physical. Exercise is considered a stress. It could be emotional. 
a death of a family member, for example, or it could be psychological, like you stressing out for your latest A&P exam. Any of these stresses are going to cause the hypothalamus to increase thyrotropin releasing hormone. And this is probably partially related to the fact that the hypothalamus is one of the pieces of the limbic system that is determining kind of the emotional state of the individual. Now, in addition to stress, we also have cold. Anytime the body is exposed to cold for several days, for example, if you took a job as a ski instructor on the local mountain, then you'd be exposed to more cold and your hypothalamus would respond by increasing the secretion of thyrotropin releasing hormone. This is true of anything that puts you in a slightly hypothermic state. So both of these things start this system off. There are a couple of things that inhibit thyrotropin releasing hormone. First of all, there's this negative feedback loop that is associated with the thyroid hormone. So when thyroid hormones elevate, they turn off thyroid stimulating hormone, they have a negative effect on the anterior pituitary, and they also have a negative effect on thyrotropin releasing hormone. So there are two things that are going to help turn off the faucet, if you will, at the anterior pituitary and the hypothalamus. In addition to this, if a person goes through a phase of fasting, where they have a decreased consumption of food, then the overall metabolism of the body is going to decrease. And fasting also will inhibit the release of thyrotropin releasing hormone. So this system works on a negative feedback loop. A few more comments before we end the illustration. The first one is to emphasize that the amounts of T3 and of T4 should remain fairly constant in the body. We want our met metabolic rate to be relatively even, so we don't want to see large fluctuations. That's why the T4 thyroxine or triodothyronine are going to bind to plasma proteins. This allows us to work on the idea of diffusion. So if I have T4 bound to proteins, then if circulating levels of free T4 decrease, then some of the bound T4 can move into circulation. That helps us keep our levels relatively constant. The other thing to note is that since the effect is the interaction with DNA and to regulate genes, which ultimately leads to that increased protein synthesis, this whole sequence is going to take quite a bit of time. So it usually takes about a week for thyroid hormones to take effect because the thyroid hormones have to be produced in response to thyroid stimulating hormone. I have to get lots of iodine out there and then that's going to lead to these interactions with the DNA. But the processes of transcription and translation are going to take a little time to take effect. The last slide of this tutorial is to discuss what type of macromolecule these hormones are made of. Are they protein-based or are they lipid-based? Because this has an implication on their effect. Thyrotropin-releasing hormone and thyroid-stimulating hormone are both protein-based, okay? which means they have a relatively short half-life. They're going to have a relatively quick effect. The T3 and T4 are amino acid derivatives, but here's where T3 and T4 act different than most protein-based hormones. T3 and T4 are amino acid derivative that comes from thyronine a type of amino acid that can be either soluble or insoluble, which is why T3 and T4 oftentimes are bound to plasma proteins to help them move about in circulation. Because of the nature of this particular amino acid, it has the capacity to act as a lipid soluble molecule. So this amino acid can move directly across the plasma membrane and the nuclear membrane to target and have an effect directly on the interior of the cell to interact with the DNA and engage transcription. This completes the tutorial on thyroid stimulating hormone. For information on hyposecretion and hypersecretion, please see the subsequent tutorial on functions of thyroid stimulating hormone.